We live in a world that is um, struggling with its identity. And that's especially true of young people in our world today that are struggling to find their way and to find who they are. It is interesting that our world is more consumed with the concept of identity perhaps than ever before, and yet at the same time, the idea of identity is more confusing than it's ever been. I'm going to deal with a topic without dealing with the topic. And what I mean by that is that I'm not going to talk about specifically things like sexual and gender identity today. But I'm going to talk about something that I think is directly related, that plays a vital role in all of that, that needs to be talked about. Let me say this about those other two things real quick. Let me also say this. I'm not a political person. Uh, I don't like politics. And you'll find that out tomorrow if you're here for my lesson when we discuss those things. And I especially don't like the way we respond to things as political issues more than as issues for humanity and spiritual issues. Because when we turn things political, we lose compassion. And we stop loving our neighbor as ourself. There's a real temptation, especially from those of us who are older. I used to think I wasn't old. I I know I'm old now. I get it. I don't need you to shake your head. Like, you don't have to be that way. But there's a tendency from some of us who are older to kind of lash out at some of these issues that we're dealing with in this lesson. And to say things like, I don't know what you're confused about. Maybe to respond with what we think is a witty, sarcastic response that we don't understand for some people is hurtful. And I want to make sure, especially for the older people in this room, because I think my younger friends, especially if you are like my kids and attend a public school or college, you understand this, That that kind of reaction that doesn't have compassion and love for other people does not win us any argument or points for the Lord. Trying to look at somebody who may be confused on some of these things and telling them how foolish they are and that it should be easy and expecting them to change is kind of like somebody looking at me and saying, the Bible isn't God's word, that's foolish, and me going, oh, okay, you're right. It doesn't work for me. Why will it work for them? The question becomes, how do, we, how do we approach people who struggle with especially identity issues that are, that are connected to their flesh? And that's really what those things are about. It's about their flesh. And how do we deal with our bodies? And that's really what we're going to focus on together because I think that the body is a problem for a lot of people. And one side of that is the idea that it's my body. I can do with it what I want. That's a, that's a common approach. And by the way, that's been kind of a political cry for some people, but it's not just politics. What this really means is because I own my body, I can use it for my pleasure, and I can use it to do whatever I want it to do. And the way that this has been manifested in our culture today is by looking at the body as something that is kind of separate from who you are as a person. There is this duality of approach to life by people today. And it looks something like this. It's this idea that my personhood is different than my body. Now let me explain where that comes from. When I was y'all's age, the argument about things specifically related to abortion was an argument about when life began. And some of you in here are old enough to remember The argument of whether life began at conception or not. Well, things have changed since I was your age. Because now, due to research and understanding of DNA, now it's undeniable that life begins at conception. 
And that created a moral challenge for people who for years had built their stance on this issue of the idea that life doesn't begin until birth. And now all of a sudden, here is a real life form separate from its mother that is carrying it. How do we explain then this option to end that child's life? And the way it was explained is, okay, it's a life, it's a living body, but it's not a person yet. And because it's not a person, then it's just a disposable body. Because that body is really just gray matter at the end of the day. And that's been attached to a variety of things in our life. Melinda Selmy said, beneath all the pageantry of free sex self-love, there's a fundamental belief that the body doesn't mean anything. That is an insignificant in a literal sense, signifying nothing. You can do anything you want with it. It's just a sort of wet machine, a tool that you can use in exchange for whatever purpose suits your fancy. Now, when we apply that idea that your body is just a tool, the exchange for whatever you want, and it doesn't matter, and it's just this disposable kind of flesh thing that you have, this wet machine or robot, that we can apply that to other areas where we see this same mentality has caused a problem for our culture. For instance, the idea of euthanasia. When it comes to the idea of euthanasia, if a person's not self-aware, can't communicate, can't make decisions effectively, they are no longer a person, they're just a body because their personhood is gone and therefore their body is disposable. Same problem. When it comes to the idea of sexual pleasure, the body is just something to be possessed for pleasure. It is designed for pleasure, but that doesn't define you as a person, what you do with your body. In fact, one 16-year-old once stated, the more detached from sexuality you can be, the cooler you are. Because it has nothing to do with you as a person now. It's just a transaction made with your body for pleasure. When it comes to identity, the body no longer identifies somebody. Why should I let this flesh restrict my identity sexually? Because the body's design, if the body itself is insignificant, the design of the body is insignificant, and all that matters is what my person wants. And my personhood defines me, and if it doesn't match my body, then I can just claim to be that person, or I can even change my body in the world we live in. And the same is true of gender. Transgender person says, I am not my body. One person wrote this. She said, I am not my body. I am a spiritual being. So I'm not defined by my flesh. And that's one side of this issue is it's my body. Now, the other side of the issue is I hate my body. You see, there's the other side of that. I don't like my body. And rather than the body being something that gives a possession that gives me pleasure and I can use however I desire or I can change or I can alter as I desire, my body is now something that I loathe, something that is a burden for me that I carry. Now, among our young people, by the way, I think one of the interesting things is that there's a real problem in our culture today, and a lot of that's been brought on by social media, and that's the problem of body dysmorphia. We, we truly don't like the way we look. And that's, that's been a problem for a long time. When I was growing up, we didn't know what the word dysmorphia meant, but we just knew we didn't like things. And one of the easiest ways to see that for my generation was every girl that had curly hair wanted straight hair, and every girl that wanted, had straight hair wanted curly hair. And the same is true of guys. Like, you can't tell, but I have, like, curly hair. And I obviously do not embrace it. I keep it cut shorter. In fact, I, I got... It's here, and I was like, man, I should have got a haircut. My hair's too long because it may start to get wavy. Now, my son has curly hair that makes your hair look straight, by the way. Yeah, I'll show you pictures. That he fashioned into a mullet. Very weird. <laughs> if you were here for the parenting class, it would all make sense. But, so, so he's learned to accept his hair, but he doesn't accept other things about himself. Like, we don't like our bodies. And part of that is because we're constantly comparing ourselves to everybody's social media, right? Where they look perfect. They're airbrushed. Some people don't like their bodies because, hey, health insurance denies you even coverage because your body doesn't fit the chart. 
So we have all these things that we don't like our bodies. What happens when your body doesn't fit the perfect mold? Mine never has. I've always been the big guy. I was laughing when JP talked about, like, it's always good to be picked first and not last. Like, unless it was tug of war, never first at the playground. Tug of war, I'm number one. But the rest of the time, I'm, I don't look athletic. I'm always the big guy. Like, I've had that all of my life. What do we do with that? How do we respond? And even deeper than that, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because I think it's interesting to think about what is said here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From a spiritual perspective, to a degree, we don't like our bodies either. Think about this starting in verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed. What's the word tent referring to here? The body. So when, you, when I read tent, you think what? Body. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we'd be unclothed, but that we'd be further clothed. So that that which is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He was prepared for this very thing as God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And, and what Paul's talking about here is like, look, there is coming this day where this corruptible body becomes incorruptible and this mortal body becomes immortal. And all the things that you hate about the body, they're gone. The disease, the, the, the death, all those things, they're gone. I mean, and get it, we all long for that day of resurrection. But as a result of this, what we've kind of done is we've taken this passage and the idea of groaning in our body to kind of say, well, this body is just like a prison. We even sing songs that kind of implement that idea, right? Here we are, but straying pilgrims. I mean, the whole point of that song is we're trapped here. I don't want to be here. I want to be in heaven. Like, I want to spend eternity with God. And, and I do. But does that mean that I should sit here and be like, I hate this body? I'm groaning? And we've practiced our own form of dualism. Rather than personhood over the body, it's spirit over the flesh. And we loathe our flesh, and we see it as this temporary dwelling place that we can't wait to get rid of. Well, what's the problem with that? I remember that I had a typo in this slide, so I'm going to... They're actually just out of order. So I'm going to go real fast so you don't see. Well, you already saw it. No, there we go. You didn't see it. What, what the problem is, is that we're practicing a modern form of Gnosticism. Now, you might have heard people throw this word Gnosticism around. And it's a really weird word that you can't even spell because it's got a silent G. It's just strange. And it goes all the way back, really, to the Greek Empire, not long after Alexander the Great and their philosophy. And there's a lot of manifestations of it, but at the end of the day, Gnosticism comes down to really one important thing, and that is what we see in this world is just gray matter, and it doesn't matter. It's not our real identity. We are trapped here and imprisoned from what is real in what is not real. And Gnosticism in its fulfillment, when it grows over time, ultimately comes to this conclusion that flesh is automatically evil and spirit is automatically good. Your body is evil and your spirit is good. And the goal is to escape the flesh. Now, Gnosticism could kind of be manifested in two different ways. One of those ways was... Since the body doesn't matter, since being here doesn't matter, just eat, drink, and be merry and do whatever you want because it doesn't matter. It's kind of like the it's my body approach. The other side of that was what we call asceticism, which was because the body doesn't matter, you loathe the body and therefore you have no physical pleasure from the body. And so you abstain from things like marriage, physical relationships, that you abstain from certain foods. You essentially lead a life where you purposely are miserable, trapped in this bodily flesh. Well, that sounds a lot like 
the I hate my body approach. And it's easy to understand, I think, why we sometimes practice this ignorantly. I mean, just think about Galatians chapter 5 and verses 16 through 26, where there you have what? You have this comparison of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Were the works of the flesh good or bad? Everybody say bad. Thank you. Were the fruit of the Spirit good or bad? So why would you want to be flesh? All that matters is spirit, right? I don't want to be flesh. And yes, I know to the older people in the room, I get that the fruit of the Spirit is not about our soul, but it's about the Holy Spirit there. I get that. I believe that. But as a young person, especially, you see that flesh, evil, spirit, good, hate my flesh. This body of mine is inherently evil. Well, no, it's not. Your body is not inherently evil. Your body's just been, well, we got to go backwards, I forgot. Your body's just been defiled by sin. It is not inherently evil. In fact, consider some texts along these lines. Romans 8 and verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the, by the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It's not the body that's put to death, it's the deeds of the body. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Cleanse ourselves in body and spirit. Both have to be cleansed there. 1 Thessalonians 5 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul says, your spirit, soul, and body can be blameless. And I want you to see that because at the end of the day, what you see is the body is not evil any more than the spirit is. They can both be defiled and they can be, both be made blameless. But we focus a lot, in fact, the book of Romans focuses on this a great deal of this flesh versus spirit conflict. So much so that we've kind of ingrained in ourselves this idea that the body is bad. And I have to tell you why that's important is I think in some ways, unwillingly, we have contributed to the problem in our world today that the body doesn't matter. And I think where our mistaken identity is is not this idea that I can't figure out who I am because the body doesn't matter, but the mistake we've made is your body does matter. And by the way, when I say that, I'm not saying your body only matters to help you understand what gender you are. Your body matters far more than that. And if we could help ourselves, young people, if I can get you to see why your body matters today, and parents, if we can start lifting up the image of the body to our children, that will answer a lot of these problems. And so what I want you to think about this afternoon, here we go, we're back on track, is reasons to love your body. And first, you should love your body because God said it was good. In Genesis chapter 1, it's kind of funny that Michael Walls and I know each other, and one of the things he's made fun of me all day is we always end up in the garden, and we do. But in Genesis chapter 1, in the creation account in verses 4 and 10 and 12 and 18 and 21 and 25, God says what about what He made? It was... Really? Y'all don't know that? It was... And what did He say in verse 31? It was... Very good. Very good. Do you know what that includes? Your body. Not just people. Your body. Look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. We read that earlier. Man, humans, made in God's image, soul and body are good. When God looks at verse 31 and looks at everything and says, it is very good. That includes the creation of not just your soul, but also your body. Now you're getting it. Listen to this in Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. 
You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of the days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them. When David says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, is he talking about my soul? Not in that context. He's talking about my body, the parts that were formed, that he molded. We are part of God's creation that he said is good. Secondly, because of that, my body serves as proof of the existence of God. When, when, uh, when I was at school down in Tampa, we were required to take this class called Evidences. And in evidence class, the first day of evidence class back then, I don't know about now, but the first class of, class of evidences class back then was ask why you believe there is a God. And every single answer we gave was wrong. Didn't matter what it was, the professor intentionally made us wrong. And then over the course of the semester, you learn different argumentation. And what was interesting is by the end of the semester, you learned that we weren't really all that wrong. He was just being difficult. But one of those arguments is called the teleological argument, which is a fancy way of saying one of the reasons you know that God exists is look at the world around you and see how amazing creation is, and that can't happen by accident. And we use fancy things like the watchmaker argument, or we talk about things like, well, if you threw a pile of wood and roofing shingles and nails and lit a stick of dynamite under it and blew it up, it wouldn't form a house, right? Right? And all of that is to say that you look around the world and there's such order, there's not chaos, everything fits together, there had to be a designer. Well, guess what part of the teleological argument is? This body. Yet, yeah. this specific body. I know you look at this body and go, no, nah, you know, that may not be the best body to say God's real. Because... <laughs> You, I mean, come on, Terry, you could have taken better care of it. One of the things I want you to understand is when it comes to the proof of God, regardless of what size, shape your body is in, how healthy it is, unhealthy it is, it is still proof of the existence of God. You are part of the evidence for there being a creator in this world. And that is humbling to me to think about. In fact, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19, Paul kind of makes the theological argument for us. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived. How has he been clearly perceived? Since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God and give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Paul says, there is no excuse to not know God. He revealed himself in creation. And if creation is a revelation of God, then your body is a revelation of God. How empowering is that? We spend so much time looking in the mirror and saying, I don't like this about my body. I don't like that about my body. And we go to such great lengths to try to change it. And regardless of what you think about your body, whether you think you're too short, too tall, curly hair, straight hair, too light skin, too dark, can't grow a beard, can grow three beards in one day, which is rough when you're a girl. I just want to see if y'all are awake. Regardless of that, your body is a declaration that there is a God. He 
he is alive. Third, and JP mentioned this early, that we are the temple of God. Not your soul, by the way. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to notice this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, not your soul. He didn't say your soul is the temple of God. He said your body is the temple of God. Starting in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and He will raise us by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them a prostitute? Members of a prostitute, never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. Flee, uh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Notice verse 13. The body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Verse 15. Your bodies are members of Christ. Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Verse 20. Glorify, your, uh, glorify God in your body. There are other texts that talk about the temple of God being the church and the collective and other things. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says that our body is the temple. Now, now here we have done in, in our life, we, we've created this dichotomy of spirit over flesh and how the two are separate in our minds and the spirit is just groaning inside of this fleshly tent, really, that we view as a prison. And yet, what Paul says is that this body you despise and you groan about, God resides in it. He's made it His temple. He lives in it. Now, that means that we need to take care of the temple. Maybe not in the way you think, because the first way we think about taking care of our bodies is going to the gym and taking care of them. And I'm, not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But what this really means here is that we should get rid of those sinful deeds of the body that Romans 8 talked about. Because here's the reality. If I am continuing to do things with my body that are sinful, God cannot reside in me. And I cannot be the temple. And that's a point of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He's trying to make. Don't do these immoral things. Why? You're the temple and God can't live in you if you're there. My body through Jesus, has been sanctified, justified, and washed so that it can be the temple of God. Consider this, Romans 6 and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under the law but under grace. Don't let sin rule your body. Instead, present your body as an instrument for righteousness. How about Romans 12 and verse 1, where the body there is described as what? I appeal you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. My body, with all of its flaws and all of its failures and all the things I don't like, is the temple of God and is a living, walking, breathing sacrifice to God every day. Every day. And Paul describes that as reasonable service. Some translations even call that reasonable worship, although the idea really is this is your offering and your service to God. Now how, how can I live as the temple, and present myself as instruments of righteousness and as a living sacrifice if I despise the very flesh that does all of those things? I can't. 
Fourth, you should love your body because Christ died for it. You see what 1 Corinthians 6, 20 said? You, and the you there is talking about our bodies, you were bought with a price. That whole section is about what you do with your body and what the body is. He's saying there, your body was bought with a price. What was the price? 1 Peter 1, 17 says, For if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile, knowing that you are ransomed from your feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that like a lamb without blemish or spot. Your body was purchased with the blood of Christ. Now, I am not saying that your body is more important than your soul. But I want you to understand this afternoon is that we need to realize Christ died for both our body and our soul. That it's all one. There is no dichotomy of body versus spirit or body versus soul in God's eyes. What He created that was good was all of you, meaning body and spirit, because He died for you. And you know what's interesting about this body that's been purchased is that it was purchased with a body. And that's what First Peter is saying, that, that Jesus gave up His body and His blood. In fact, we gather around a table every week to remember that, don't we? That He broke His body and He spilled His blood physical You are redeemed by the physical body of Jesus, by His flesh. But His body was raised, and ours will be raised too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. And that whole section that talks about your physical body and what not to do in your body and how your body was purchased and how you should glorify God in your body and how your body's the temple, he makes this statement that God raised the Lord and he will raise you up too. What's he going to raise? He's going to raise your body. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 18 through 23, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of His children of God. Look, we're looking forward to that day. No doubt. We can't wait for the resurrection. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 42, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable, the sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. And if there's a natural body, there will be a spiritual body. Look at Philippians 3, 20 and 21. And we'll talk more about this passage tomorrow. But for our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will do what? Who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. All of these passages talk about how we wait for this physical body to be raised, transformed, changed into this glorious body. And I will tell you that I don't understand everything there is about eternity. And there's a lot of questions about what it's going to be like and, and, and what the body is going to be like. And I, I don't know a lot of things, but I can tell you one thing I'm convinced of is that it is a bodily resurrection that awaits us. That just like Jesus' tomb was empty, so will ours be. What will the body look like? I don't know. I can't tell you. 
the picture of resurrection is that God takes my body and He raises it up and He transforms it to something that is imperishable, incorruptible, worthy, and honorable. And that should make me love my body. You know, I, I look around the world today and I see all the immorality around us. And like a lot of people, I see things that just kind of baffle me. It's not that there's more immorality than there's ever been, by the way. Like, if you study history, this stuff has gone on for a long time. But it does seem to be celebrated more. And issues like these identity issues, they concern me. It concern me with my children raised, being raised in this environment. But as I started off, let me say again, I want us to think about how we respond to those issues. We won't win people over with sarcasm. You're not going to win the debate about gender or sexual identity through your social media post. You're not going to find some witty, well-designed meme that's suddenly going to convince everybody that they're wrong. And let me tell you something about those kinds of things. Those kinds of things, they're not designed to unify us. They're designed to divide us and to create more chaos. Because that's what drives more of the things to be done. They're intended to polarize us based on our candidates and our platforms and to create a social and cultural divide between us. And when you give in to that, you're becoming a part of the problem and not the solution. But when we have those, and maybe, I'm going to tell you something, Adults, listen to me. We are going to have young people we love struggle with these things if they're not already. It may not be a family member, but it will be somebody close to us who is going to struggle with their identity related to their flesh. And dehumanizing them is not the answer. It has never been the answer. I think what the answer is is to remind people that we have been made in the image of God and to remind them of the biblical worldview that God loves our bodies. He said they were good. They are proof of His existence. They are His temple today. They have been purchased by His Son and He is going to raise them up one day. And maybe if we start living that way, celebrating our bodies rather than demeaning them and looking down upon them, Maybe if we start really celebrating the totality of God's creation and not just the soul and the spirit, but our bodies as well. And maybe if we change our minds and stop living like spiritual beings trapped in the prison of our walking flesh, maybe we can change the world around us. And let me say this to parents. Help your child love their body. Regardless what it looks like. Regardless of what it can do or what it cannot do. Help your children love the body God gave them. It's a gift that He called good. And young people, I want you to glorify God in your body. I want you to realize that you are the temple of God. I want you to realize that Jesus died to cleanse your body from its deeds, but also to raise your body from the dead one day.
JP talked earlier about our job is to go out into the world and to show them the Lord. And I think this is an area of evangelism that we don't understand yet, but our job, part of that, is going to be going out into the world and showing the world how to embrace and love the body God gave them. And that starts with us. And then we can take it to them. I thank you for your attention and leave us with the challenge to glorify God in our bodies. I praise you with all of my-